Hello, I'm Kelly McFarland, and this is Diplomatic Immunity from the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. My friends, I want to talk to you today very simply about government. We need to use diplomacy and build international consensus to resolve our problems whenever possible. Our diplomats are working with a range of partners to strengthen human rights protections. This is not a time to undercut our diplomats. And today, in our boasted modern civilization, we are facing just exactly the same problem, just exactly the same conflict between two schools of philosophy. When we think of the United Nations, one of the first things that come to mind for many people, especially those in conflict-affected countries, is the blue helmets of UN peacekeepers. These blue helmets, as they're called, have become ubiquitous in many regions of the world in recent decades. In this episode, we took a more thematic approach to multilateralism to look at the role that peacekeeping plays. When did it begin and why? How has it evolved over the years and how effective has it been? We discuss these questions and more with my Georgetown colleague and peacekeeping expert, Lise Howard. Lise Howard is Professor of Government and Foreign Service at Georgetown University and President of the Academic Council on the United Nations System. Her research and teaching interests span the fields of international relations, comparative politics, and conflict resolution. She has published articles and book chapters about civil wars, peacekeeping, and American foreign policy in many leading journals such as International Organization, International Security, International Studies Quarterly, International Peacekeeping, Global Governance, Foreign Affairs, and with Oxford University Press. Her book, UN Peacekeeping in Civil Wars, in Cambridge University Press in 2008, about organizational learning, won the 2010 Book Award from the Academic Council on the UN System. Her recent book, Power in Peacekeeping, also from Cambridge University Press from 2019, is based on field research in the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Lebanon, and Namibia. It won the 2021 Book Award from the International Security Studies section of the International Studies Association. You can find some of her recent work in the show notes. Dr. Howard earned her MA and PhD in political science from UC Berkeley and her AB in Soviet studies from Barnard College, Columbia University. She has held year-long fellowships at Stanford University, Harvard University, and the U.S. Institute of Peace. Dr. Howard is fluent in French and Russian and speaks some Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, Spanish, and German. Prior to her career in academia, she served as acting director of UN Affairs for the New York City Commission for the United Nations. Let's listen to the conversation. All right, so joining us today is my fellow Georgetown colleague and uh, Board of Advisors member at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy, Dr. Lise Howard. And Lise, thanks for joining us today. Kelly, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So as you know, this season of the podcast, we're talking about multilateralism, and we've talked to folks at the UN about the role the UN plays. We've talked to folks at the African Union, Organization of American States, and now we're looking at some of the more functional issues that multilateralism takes on. And uh, that's why we brought you in today to talk to us. Um, And the first question I'm going to throw at you is, uh, I'm hoping you can start us off with some scene setting. Because while technically peacekeeping operations are not specifically mentioned in the UN Charter, there, you know, obviously countries do partake in peacekeeping. So how did this come to be a tool for the UN in maintaining peace and security? And and how has that evolved over time? Great question. So you're absolutely right. Peacekeeping is not mentioned in the Charter. Peace is mentioned an awful lot. And... Uh, At the end of World War II, on the founding of Israel in 1948, um, there was this idea that in order to conclude a peace between Israel and its neighbors, a new form of ceasefire monitoring had to come into being. And that's when the basic ideas of peacekeeping came, started floating around and becoming institutionalized. So these three basic ideas were floating around then, and it was mainly Ralph Bunch, I'll note, who was the author of these ideas. Ralph Bunch, an American diplomat, he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1950 for his work in the Middle East. So the first idea was consent, that in order 
to conclude the fighting around Israel, that there would need to be consent of the belligerents for an impartial force. So these, this idea of consent and impartiality went together. And then also that there would, that this force, a multinational force that would have this kind of legitimacy in order for that force to have legitimacy and be perceived as impartial, that it would only be able to use uh, limited force. And indeed the first peacekeepers were unarmed. So they were patrolling and monitoring ceasefire lines around uh, the Holy Land uh, with the consent of all the sides. Now, that those basic ideas, consent, impartiality, and the limited use of force, those resurfaced again uh, during the Suez crisis in 1956. So in 1956, we had this need for impartial uh, observers to observe the withdrawal of Israeli, um, British, and French forces from Egypt, from the Suez Canal. And this, this mission was called the United Nations Emergency Force. It was, operate, it, was, it was authorized by the General Assembly, not the Security Council. So the first big peacekeeping force was actually authorized, it's, it's interesting to note, by the General Assembly because, specifically because it involved great powers, because it involved monitoring French and British withdrawal from Suez. And then over the years, peacekeeping evolved. So originally it was, it was conceived to be about ceasefire monitoring and troop withdrawal monitoring. And then after the end of the Cold War, the nature of war shifted from interstate wars to civil wars. We saw a dramatic increase in civil wars. And that's when the Security Council agreed that they should start sending UN peacekeepers to help implement ceasefire agreements within countries. So in countries experiencing civil wars and for these missions to become more and more multi multi-dimensional and that they would help oversee this process of transitioning from war to peace within countries as opposed to between countries. So as war shifted, so did peacekeeping. Yeah, and you mentioned the shift in peacekeeping and I, I imagine that not every peacekeeping mission is equal and there's different types of peacekeeping missions. And you actually wrote uh, an insightful book on this called Power and Peacekeeping, which we'll link in show notes so people have, can, can take a look at it. And you talk about three types of power um, pe that peacekeeping wields, and that's persuasion, inducement, and coercion short of compellence. Uh, and I was wondering if you could sort of provide some examples by, uh, of what you mean by those different types. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the shout out. But we always love yeah. to give plugs on our show. <laughs> I'm happy to receive it. <laughs> so, so we, uh, yeah, so we're talking about three types of power. I think in a lot of international relations, these are the three types of power that, that countries try to exercise when they're dealing with each other. So if we think of power as the ability to change another actor's behavior, so we know that there's an exercise of power if we see a change in behavior. How do you get somebody to change their behavior? How does the UN convince warring parties to stop fighting? And I'm arguing that it, you see three basic types of actions, persuasion, inducement, and coercion. Persuasion is ideational, right? So this is about ideas and non-material ways of getting people to change their behavior. So this is where we see UN peacekeepers mediating and providing outreach and public information. Uh, we see these symbolic displays, right, of the pacifistic intent and this uh, with the blue helmets and the white vehicles um, that peacekeepers are symbolizing a different way of conducting politics. And then we have inducement. Inducement is material. It's about providing things that people need and also restricting things in order to temper bad behavior. So peacekeepers provide humanitarian assistance. They provide, um, they, they, they also provide development assistance or they enable development assistance. So moving beyond humanitarian emergency assistance. And then they also help to restrict markets. So this is a kind of a more economic form of an institutional form of changing behavior. And then we have coercion. Coercion is the thing that we think peacekeepers might engage in because peacekeepers are 
generally troops, right? They're they're they are they come from member states' military forces or police forces. Uh, they know how to engage in combat, but what they're doing is generally not about using compellence to change behavior. They're using other forms of coercion. So, for example, um, they're preventing. Uh, people from being attacked. So they're defending civilians. They can defend themselves. The requirements for defense are lower than for engaging in offensive attack. So in other words, they can, they can protect civilians. They can defend civilians. Um, but that's not to say that, that, they, that they can go out and using military force defeat uh, an armed actor. And then they also engage in surveillance and monitoring that also conditions behavior when you have armed actors surveilling troops, uh, other people's actions, and then arrest in some peacekeeping missions, not most, but every now and then we see peacekeepers uh, with the mandate, with the power of arrest. So those are the, the three basic forms, persuasion, inducement, and coercion. So these are ideal types. Uh, sometimes they overlap. Ideal types are, are never perfect, and you see peacekeepers exercising different forms of them at the same time. But I would say that they basically, the ways in which peacekeepers exercise power fall into these three basic forms. So as I noted earlier, this, this season of the, of the podcast looks at multilateralism as a tool, and we're really t- trying to figure out the you know, what are the different aspects of multilateralism? And also, is it effective or is it not effective? And oftentimes, I think the the conventional wisdom on on some peacekeeping, on some aspects of peacekeeping is that it's that it's kind of been a failure in, in, in many places over the years, when you think back to a lot of places in Africa in the 90s and things like that. And that sort of I, I think sometimes comes to the forefront of people's minds when they think about UN peacekeeping and everything. But you know the the alternative many times is is potentially a unilateral state intervening or something like that that doesn't have the broader consensus of something like the United Nations and their peacekeeping forces. So, what? How do you? How effective do you think peacekeeping has been on the whole, especially when compared to the other alternatives that are out there? Mm, thank you. Um... I love this question. So, and and luckily, I don't have to answer it based only on my own research. Uh, um, I'm going to start by talking about the quantitative literature. I won't give any specifics about the quantitative findings, but I will say that we've had 16 peer-reviewed studies now in different journals, different research teams with different research agendas, not always looking at peacekeeping, all published in the top peer-reviewed journals. 16 studies now show that when there are UN peacekeepers, there's less civilian death during war. Um, We also see that where UN peacekeepers are deployed, we see a geographic contraction of the conflict within a country. So if there is a country in civil war, we see less spread of violence. We know that civil wars tend to spread across borders. Where there are UN peacekeepers, there's statistically less spread of violence across borders. Um, We also have some really interesting findings about the likelihood of a peace agreement. Peace agreements are much more likely to be achieved during negotiations when there's a promise of having UN peacekeepers. Uh, There are a lot of other findings. I would encourage you to look at an article by Barbara Walter, Paige Fortnut, and myself in the British Journal of Political Science, where we we survey a lot of the recent quantitative literature as well as some of the qualitative literature. In my own research in in that book, Power and Peacekeeping, that you noted, I list uh, of the 16 completed big multi-dimensional peacekeeping missions since the end of the Cold War. So we've had these, these missions that are very complex that are trying to help societies transition from war to peace. So they're doing all kinds of things. It's not just monitoring ceasefire lines and delivering humanitarian aid, but they're, they're helping reform economic institutions and political institutions. They're helping uh, uh, reconstitute judicial systems. It's, it's, very comprehensive, these missions, these multidimensional missions. Of the 16 completed missions, 
about 12 have successfully implemented their mandates. So in other words, we're looking at a two-thirds success rate in implementing these very difficult, complex mandates. Now, the missions that you remember, that all of us remember, the complex missions that failed, especially in the early to mid-1990s in Somalia, in Rwanda, uh, I would add Angola, although most people don't remember Angola. So in, success, in secession in 1993, 94, 95, we had Somalia, Rwanda, and Bosnia, the genocide in, in Srebrenica. So these big, tragic, uh, terrible failures in UN peacekeeping, where we saw massive death before the very eyes of UN peacekeepers. That has not happened again in 26 years. We haven't had another time when peacekeepers have stood by and watched a genocide occur. I think, as you know, I've been conducting field research in the Central African Republic on and off since 2015. And I'm quite convinced there would have been a genocide in the Central African Republic had it not been for the actions of UN peacekeepers. So that's to answer that question, kind of the overall success and failure rates. We, we know that there are still plenty of problems in peacekeeping, don't get me wrong. And the current very large missions in Mali, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in South Sudan, in Lebanon, and in the Central African Republic, those five big missions are, how should I say, they are undoubtedly saving lives. Statistically, we have a lot of evidence that there's that all else equal, were they to withdraw, we'd have more death. But they're still confronting many, many obstacles in helping societies transition to peace. You mentioned the the, the three well-known failures in the early to mid-90s uh, and the success rates since then. Um, so, so what changed? Was it, some, was it just the nature of those conflicts that... that made it so difficult? Or was it something that the UN did in follow on peacekeeping missions that has made them more successful? That's a great question, Kelly. Thank you so much. Uh, quite a few things have changed in peacekeeping. So uh, in 1999, the UN conducted a, a massive reevaluation of peacekeeping and decided to shift toward focusing on the protection of civilians that peacekeepers would have the mandate to protect civilians. And indeed, in 1999, we saw a shift after 1999, all peacekeeping, all multidimensional peacekeeping missions are mandated to protect civilians. And they are also all mandated now under chapter seven of the UN Charter to protect civilians. So chapter seven is the peace enforcement provision of the UN Charter. And chapter six is the Pacific Settlement of Disputes chapter of the part of the charter. So the UN Charter doesn't specifically discuss peacekeeping, as you mentioned at the very beginning. And there's always been this question of whether peacekeeping falls under chapter six, Pacific Settlement of Disputes, or chapter seven with peace enforcement provisions. And since 1999, all multidimensional peacekeeping missions now fall under chapter seven to to have the capacity to use tactical force to protect civilians. I would ask, I would add one more thing, <laughs> one more important thing, which is that there was also a recognition that sometimes there is a necessity to use force. And obviously if peacekeepers use offensive force, then they're no longer peacekeepers. Then they've, they've moved into the, they've sort of crossed the border into military action actors. And so increasingly, we see also since that time, peacekeeping missions deployed either alongside standard military forces, special operations forces also, or after special operations forces have engaged in combat. So for example, in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, in East Timor, in the Balkans, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, in, in the Central African Republic, we see case after case where military units have a, have a very narrow mandate to achieve a certain military outcome when it comes to belligerence in the conflict. And then UN peacekeepers follow on 
or they deploy alongside. And they engage in all those things that peacekeepers are pretty good at. All right. So I want to broaden out a little bit um, for this question to talk about the UN more broadly and uh, current geopolitical competitions that are going on, obviously US-Russia, but even more so US-China in the in the coming years. H- how do you see those competitions playing out in the UN? Uh, it's a great question. I, I think at this point, the US-China rivalry in the UN is an easier nut to crack than Russia and the West. It's not just the US. It seems in the South China Sea that China may be a revisionist power. But when it comes to the UN, China, it appears, prefers the institutions of the UN, working through the UN. So in other words, China um, recently held uh, the top positions in four of 16 UN agencies. That's diminishing now that the US has recognized China's interest in the UN. China has a lot of junior um sort of P2 early entry folks working in the UN system, working their ways up through the UN system. China has has become the second largest financial contributor to UN peacekeeping. It has actually the largest standby peacekeeping force, trained peacekeeping force of any country in the world. It's the only P5 country in the top 10 UN troop contributors to UN peacekeeping. So in other words, China has been rising in the UN system. It's been rising in the domain of peacekeeping. It's interested in in maintaining a stable status quo. It has differences with the West, obviously, when it comes to democracy and, and how we interpret human rights. China has a very different interpretation of what human rights means. So, but in in general, my sense is that China is not interested in blowing up the UN or the UN system. I'm not sure of the same of Russia right now. I just don't know where we are. Uh, Russia has, by violating Ukraine's sovereignty, by attacking its neighbors, by engaging in imperialist military exercises, Russia is overturning the entire uh, the entire normative framework that the UN was built up around. The UN was was made to respect sovereignty between states and really to stop colonialism. I mean, that was its main activity until the, through the 1960s is overseeing the end of colonialism. And most of us thought that that was that that kind you know. Inter-colonial wars where neighbors were trying to take each other's territories or colonial powers were trying to take stuff from other folks, that that kind of war was done. And indeed, since it's been 77 years since we've had this kind of a war. It's a very long time that we've had a war with a major power where the major power is trying to take territory from its neighbor. That just has not happened in 77 years. So in this project that I'm working on this year, I'm a residential fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace. So I'm I'm on leave from Georgetown, from teaching at Georgetown. I'm working on the Russia-Ukraine team. I speak Russian. I majored in Soviet studies way back when one could major in Soviet studies and not have it be a degree in history. (laughs) Uh, And now, um, uh, and we're trying to figure out how well it, my my pursuits are more limited right so i'm serving on the russia ukraine team that with that team has a broad mandate what i'm at usip to do is to figure out how to answer these two questions what made for the end of that type of warfare why did we have the end of these colonial wars of conquest of neighbors trying to conquer each other's territory what 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 were the conditions under which we had an end of that type of warfare? We didn't have an end of all war, but we had an end of that thing. And then with some exceptions, right? Iran, Iraq, Ethiopia, Eritrea, we had some exceptions through, over time, but really there were with very few exceptions. And then why 2022? Why did Russia invade Ukraine in 2022 when Russia had been playing by the rules for eight years, more or less by the rules? 
right? So the war in, in Ukraine in eastern Donbass was manageable. It had a very low death rate for the last eight years. They had OSCE monitors monitoring every shell. And Russia and the Ukrainian governments had agreed to have these OSCE monitors monitoring their dispute. And I think that that in part is why we had such low death rates in eastern Ukraine. Why did that change? What shifted? So anyway, Kelly, I would love to have this conversation with you at some point off air to find out what you think. <laughs> I'm, st I'm working on answering the question. I think for answering the question of why no wars of this type for 77 years, um, I, I've looked back at the Security Council's record and 50 times, five zero times, there were militarized, there are lots of militarized disputes in the world. Lots of states have border disputes. Actually, pretty much every state in the world has a border dispute. There is no state that had the borders that it has right now forever, right? All states are, are quote unquote artificial creations in the sense that they didn't exist at one point and now they do. So we had a lot of interstate war for a long time and every state in the UN's in the international system had different borders. And so every state pretty much has a border dispute or could have a border dispute. And yet they're not fighting over their borders. So 50 times since 1945, there have been militarized interstate disputes that went to the UN Security Council for resolution and the Security Council resolved the disputes. So the Security Council heard the parties um, and came to some form of resolution. Sometimes it was referral to the International Court of Justice. Sometimes it sent peacekeepers to monitor a ceasefire line. There were a variety of solutions over the years. But in other words, we could have had 50 more interstate wars than we did since World War II. And so that, in a sense, in my mind, is one of the most important functions of the UN Security Council is to resolve interstate disputes. The UN Security Council, now if we're talking about Russia and China and the US, the UN Security Council is the only forum where the US and China and Russia meet daily. We have our diplomats talking to each other every single day in this forum. If we didn't have this forum, we would not have this valve of diplomatic communication. And so in that sense, you know, there are calls to suspend the Security Council, to disband it, to reform. I think there should be reform of the UN Security Council, absolutely. But I will also say that it still, it remains in my mind of tremendous value to have this multilateral forum where all the great powers are talking to each other, or at least our diplomats are talking to each other uh, on a daily basis. Well, Lise Howard, I appreciate you taking the time and, and chatting with us today. It's always a fun chat and we could, you know, I could go on forever talking to you about this and like getting down into the weeds of interstate conflict over the last 70 years and what you guys are looking at and stuff. And we will have that conversation at some point offline because I'd like to talk to you more about this. But um, Thank you so much for joining us uh, on this episode of Diplomatic Community. Thank you, Kelly. I really appreciate it. See you soon. It was heartening to discover the research that has been done that demonstrates the effectiveness of peacekeeping operations in the past few decades, and that the UN has learned from earlier failures in places like Somalia, Rwanda, and Srebrenica. And I don't know about you, but I'm eagerly anticipating the findings from Lise and her USIP colleagues on Ukraine and its broader implications for interstate conflict. I'd like to thank Lise once again for a fascinating conversation. Until we meet again. This episode was produced by Daniel Henderson. Thank you to the Carnegie Corporation of New York for their support for this podcast. Be sure to check out any episodes you may have missed via our website. Please rate, review, and follow this podcast wherever you listen and tell your friends and colleagues to come find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else they listen. Follow us on Twitter, at GU Diplomacy, and visit our website, isd.georgetown.edu, to learn more about our work.